Immortalized in polyethylene and hailed by the Smithsonian as one of the best known icons of American pop culture kitsch, this pink bird might not be for everyone. But everyone can agree, this pink bird is iconic. Welcome back to Iconic Objects, where we get all pew 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 about the most iconic furniture and decor items ever. When you recall the plastic pink flamingo, where have you seen her? Adorning your grandma's front lawn in Florida? Maybe. Fading in the sun near a Las Vegas hotel? Or perhaps standing en masse outside of a frat house? Or maybe you have an expanded recollection, having seen the bird in patterned wallpaper in your neighborhood's newest, cutest coffee shop or as a neon silhouette in the window of a gay bar. But if none of these ring a bell, there's a little something called the frequency illusion, which means that you're about to start seeing pink flamingos everywhere, or everywhere for at least the next 10 minutes. You're welcome. So let's find out how this pink bird managed to start popping up all over our collective imaginations, starting with our front lawn. We can trace the evolution of lawn decor to the royal courtyards and elite gardens of ancient history. But according to historian Dr. Jennifer Price, we can more accurately trace the history of our pink lawn friends to the days of 17th century France. Isn't it always? Hello, Versailles. The French landscaping architects tasked with designing the green of the Palace of Versailles and other royal gardens really valued opulent outdoor ornamentation, peppering their manicured parterres with sculptures of mythical figures like dragons, satyrs, nymphs, and Greek gods. However, across the channel, the English landscape designers found these decorations to be rather Baroque, aka gaudy and artificial, which is not not true. That's kind of what it is. To the Brits, these French folk were doing way too much on their proverbial front lawns. And of course, at the time, the Brits and the French did not see eye to eye on a lot of things. But that is for another history lesson. As the 18th century rolled around, England was all peak romanticism, emphasis on human emotion and connection to nature, etc. So that meant bringing nature to their front lawns, decorating with real wildlife, from realistic statues to actual animals. They even went so far as to physically create landscapes from building hills to reorienting rivers. Like it wasn't Versailles extra, but it was extra. You see, the English and the French might not have had a ton in common, but you know what they did have in common? And I hope you are sitting down and clutching your garden gnome for this one, folks. The English and the French put forth the very notion that one could demonstrate something as subjective as taste with lawn decor. Dr. Jennifer Price writes, what is taste? A universally superior sensibility, or so goes the assumption. And what better place to prove one's good taste than on the bit of nature that was closest at hand? One's own front lawn. So naturally, when Americans saw this, we were all about it. Yeah, we were in. We were like, okay, yes, say no more. Fast forward to the 1900s. And yes, I skipped a couple centuries. It's fine, it's fine. Let's move on. At this time, lawn decor, previously considered an aesthetic for high society folk, pivots to welcome a growing middle class. And all of a sudden, yard animals are back in vogue, except this time, we've got all these cool new materials to make them. 1920s aluminum, 1930s concrete, 1940s skip hashtag world war and then in the 1950s plastics but when oh when will the pink flamingo actually come into the story right now baby the year is 1956 the place is lemonster massachusetts the business union products the mission make fun stuff out of plastic now again, it's the 1950s, the dawn of suburbia, and the suburban dream expanded exponentially. As mentioned earlier, this post-war boom of suburban working class consumers and their suburban homes presented a whole new market for lawn decor. War's over, honey. Let's buy a house with a lawn, and why stop there? Let's decorate it. You see, the American dream is much simpler than you think. So as folks sought to accessorize and theoretically differentiate their lawns, Union Products saw their niche. They'd been watching America's Next Top Material, and well, plastic was the winner. 
This stuff would make lawn decor cheaper and easier to make than ever. In 1956, they hired a guy named Don Featherstone, which, yes, does sound like the name of a superhero bird man. Don Featherstone had just graduated from art school and was hired to specifically design their lawn and garden ornaments. In an interview with a Lemonster newspaper 50 years later, Don claimed he simply took the job because, quote, he didn't want to starve to death. Hard relate, Featherstone. So when Don was asked to come up with a design for a plastic pink flamingo, Without a visual reference, he consulted a National Geographic. In it, an article called Ballerinas in Pink offered some great reference photos. In about three weeks' time, Featherstone had sculpted a pair of birds in clay, one with its head upright, the other with its head down. A realistic flamingo mold to mass produce in plastic and sachet themselves all over American lawns. And so they did. The flamingos were sold and advertised all over various department stores and home catalogs, Sears, Woolworths, Ben Franklin's, sometimes with specific directions. Place in garden, lawn, to beautify landscape. And they were a hit. Now there are a few reasons for that. One being that the color pink was all the rage in the 50s. And secondly, Florida vacations were all the rage. And flamingos were an exotic symbol of travel to the state. Ah, oh, Florida often appearing in the names of various hotels and resorts and nightlife spots. The admiration and symbolism attributed to bird species is historically well known. Owls symbolize wisdom, eagles, power and pride, swans, romance, and pink flamingos? Well, they're just a dang good time. In 2007, when Featherstone was asked by the Chicago Tribune why the pink flamingos were so popular, his answer was, well, iconic. A woman could pick up a flamingo at the store and come home with a piece of tropical elegance under her arm for less than $10. Before that, only the wealthy could afford to have bad taste. And so Featherstone made his mark on American culture with one college art degree, one issue of National Geographic, and one modest attempt at beautifying American lawns. And then the critics came. Now, the critics of the pink flamingo are undoubtedly vast, but I will say, the first wave of criticism was a little dramatic. In 1968, Jill O'Dorfles, an art critic, painter, and philosopher, released Kitsch, The World of Bad Taste. In it, he talks about a particular type of kitsch that has evolved into, quote, one of the crucial problems in the history of art. A prominent example he uses, you guessed it, lawn decor. So, okay, now what we've got is the high art world losing their minds about pink birds, and then of course the sweeping tyrannical power of what is known as the Homeowners Association. From lawn decor to laundry lines, swing sets, paint colors and roof shingles, the nervous Nellies of Homeowners Association set out to valiantly ban such visual nuances in their communities. Concerned that such objects, such as a pair of pink plastic flamingos, wielded enough power to actually decrease property values. The drama! The outrage. And then, of course, the generations and movements that followed the baby boomers naturally rebelled against everything they did. Scorning suburban artifice and consumerism and the general cultural disillusionment perpetuated by their parents. And even if they weren't the primary target, our sweet pink flamingos got swept up in the crossfire. <laughs> Culture is odd, isn't it? Like today, we have words like kitschy and campy and chuggy and post-ironic. All of these words that amount in various levels and art forms to the idea of embracing that which society has deemed aesthetically no good, or shall we say, in bad taste. Having amassed quite a reputation in the decades since its release, the pink flamingo went from bringing tropical fun to front lawns to supposedly damaging their value, to then apparently becoming one of the crucial problems in the history of art. Until one day, the pink flamingo finally and ironically said, love thy hater, and enter the pink flamingo's hot girl era. Subverting society's unofficial taste police, various art scenes and subcultures started embracing the pink flamingo and proudly declared, your trash is my treasure. 
1972, John Waters released the film Pink Flamingos, a cult classic that proudly declared itself an exercise in poor taste. And in 1979, University of Wisconsin students famously pranked the school by planting a thousand pink flamingos outside of the dean's office. Amazing. And I am excited to report that the plastic bird has since been made the official bird of Madison, Wisconsin. As the pink flamingo began to symbolize a challenge to high art and rigid societal conventions, it soon found a home in LGBTQ communities, adopting it as a playful mascot for self-expression. Our Countess of Kitsch went on to become the queen of camp. As Jennifer Price writes, the bird became the ultimate marker for crossing boundaries of every conceivable kind. Man, these flamingos really got a leg up, huh? Today, pink flamingos are their own decor category. Breaking their plastic mold and fleeing the front lawn, these birds have made their mark all over the home in wallpaper, pillowcases, wall art, and lighting. Over the years, these birds have been loaded with so much meaning, and today, they have simply returned to just being fun. In an article for Apartment Therapy, Madeline Billis writes that now is the perfect time to resurrect lawn kitsch. And she calls for the return of plastic flamingos to our front lawn. A new kind of curb appeal is needed, one that doesn't inspire real estate agents to use the word manicured to describe it. Bring back lawn ornaments of yesteryear. And I couldn't agree more. Well, folks, thanks for tuning in for another episode of Iconic Objects. And thank you to Wayfair for embracing the pink flamingo and abundantly providing enough lawn decor to accommodate all of our varying styles and tastes. We'll see you next time.